There's a pretty one, Ulysses. Hello Booktube, I'm Sean the Book Maniac. Welcome back to my channel. Here I am with another tag. And this one is the Finally Fall book tag. The 2018 version. Yes, I did this last fall. It's a great tag. I saw Sabrina of Unmanaged Mischief do it. It was her first time a few days ago and I thought, hey, I want to do it again with all new answers to the prompts. Why not? It's a perennial fall tag. I was generically tagged last year by just one reader. He said, anybody who wants to do it, do it. I took that as a as an open invitation and I did it. And uh, Juan, I'm tagging you back. You need to do it again too, don't you? The original tag was by Tall Tales. I'll put a link to their uh, videos in the show notes. And let's get started. So, prompt number one. In the fall, the air is crisp and clear. Name a book with a vivid setting. Last year, I kind of poo-pooed the idea of setting in literature that I don't really pay much attention, and I pay more attention now. A year of really uh, solid, intense reading has kind of shifted my, deepened my perspective. Yeah, setting's important, and I would say that this year's choice would be this wonderful novel, one of my top reads of last year, The Lost Garden by Helen Humphreys. She is a Canadian novelist, although you would barely know it because most of her books are not set in Canada, which is totally fine with me, a 2002 release. And this one is set in 1941 in London. Uh, in London, and then the protagonist, a uh, eccentric middle-aged woman, goes out to the Devon countryside to help with the war effort, growing vegetables for the army or something. And it's that setting that's so vivid because she discovers a lost garden and it becomes a rich uh, setting for a really deeply told story of loneliness and yearning and Virginia Woolf and gardens. I cannot recommend this book highly enough. I'll read a little bit of a longer passage. I'm not gonna read from every book I talk about, but this is about the setting, so let me give you a sense of the setting. So she's in this Devonshire, it's an old landed estate which has been donated to the war effort for the, for the duration of the war. I get out of bed, dress hastily, and run down the stairs and out into the night. If I can't sleep, I might as well do something useful. I will go over to the walled garden and stand guard in case the chicken-thieving spirit dares to show up again. I am suddenly revived, seized with purpose rushing through the cool night air over the grass of the quadrangle. I am once more a woman of action. I hurtle myself willingly forward to my fate. My fate is to crouch next to the old gardener's office in the kitchen garden, wishing I brought something to sit on because the ground is so cold. I lean up against the rough skin of bricks, peer out across the dark patch of dug earth toward the chicken coop. I can make out the shape of it. The moon sheds enough light so that I will be able to see anything or anyone approaching the enclosure. I wrap my arms around my knees and wait. I remember being a child and sitting outside the house in the dark. The flowers in the beds were shadowy beside me, swaying slightly in a way I was used to, a way I found comforting. I was hiding from my mother waiting for her to discover my absence and come looking for me. Eventually, the ground would get too cold and hard, and I would go back inside the house to find my mother asleep in her chair, or worse, reading a magazine. Where did you come from? She'd say. Yes, The Lost Garden, a wonderful little novel. My hot coffee from the vending machine. Prompt number two. Nature is beautiful but also dying. Name a book that is beautifully written but also deals with a heavy topic like loss or grief. And I have chosen a book that I read for the first time at the end of 2017 Virginia Woolf's To the Lighthouse. And 
Every time I read Mrs. Dalloway, and now that I've read To the Lighthouse, and my memory of reading The Waves, which I we talk about later in the video, I think, oh, this is my favorite Virginia Woolf. So after I finished reading this, I thought, yeah, this is my favorite Virginia Woolf. So I don't know. They're all my favorite. I did this as an audio text combo, the audio book being narrated by the wonderful Juliet Stevenson, and that was just an incredible experience. And this is a depiction of a family holiday, and there are uh, time jumps, there's a first section and a second section during, and by the second section, several years after the first one, uh, one of the main characters has died, so there's a lot of stuff about grief and yearning and uh, feeling a sense of failure in one's life and wanting to create and wanting to connect. I absolutely loved it, so that's my pick for that one. Number three, fall is back to school season. Share a non-fiction book that taught you something new. So I'm not going to repeat what I always say when I have to talk about non-fiction. I'm not much of a non-fiction reader. So it's a true answer, but it's a little bit of a cop-out. The book that I've read this year that was non-fiction that taught me something new was Christopher Fowler's The Book of Forgotten Authors, which was a series of, I forget, 30 or 50 or 75 bite-sized essays about authors that once were popular that have kind of disappeared from the cultural literary radar and I as much as there were some major flaws with that book I loved it so much because it introduced me to a whole bunch of writers uh, a half dozen of whom I have since gone on to read so that was uh, wonderful and I recommend it to you if you're looking for uh, uh, authors and books that are kind of off the beaten track like I am often looking for, check out the Book of Forgotten Authors. I say the essays are like three or four pages long and uh, very well written and just make you want to buy all the books he talks about. It's a little bit too heavy on mystery and uh, thriller writers for my taste, but there was uh, dozens of, of uh, literary writers mentioned and several of whom I have gone on to read and really enjoyed. Number four, in order to keep warm, it's good to spend some time with the people we love. Name a fictional family, household, or friend group you'd like to be part of. So, I'm always saying, uh, non-fiction, blah, 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 but I'm going to cheat the opposite way for this, and I'm going to name a real family, because, no, I don't tend to read books about people I'd like to spend time with, or, or a group of people. One person, maybe. Like if, if it was just name a person you'd like to hang out with, that would be easy, but a friend group or a... Family? No, 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 no. That's those kind of uh, desirable groups of people don't typically show up in my fiction. <laughs> so I have chosen the Benson family. I just finished this yesterday. I talked about it on Friday Reads yesterday. But the Benson family was absolutely fascinating. E.F. Benson was the novelist, most famous today for his Lucia series, Map and Lucia being the best, I think, and the one that I love the most. But his father was the Archbishop of Canterbury, and his mother, Mary Benson, was one of the most fascinating women in the late 19th, early 20th century. And the, the father died pretty young, thank God, because he was an old poop. And the mother promptly shacked up with a woman and shared her bed with her for the rest of her life. And all of the children, there was six children, some died fairly young, but none of them married and... 85.6% of them were gay or lesbian, plus the mother, and they were all so bright, and they all, the children, wrote many books, all of them were writers, and they would congregate and have these intellectual or whatever kind of discussions at the dinner table, and then half of them would go up to their rooms right after dinner and write really bitchy <laughs> diary entries about each other. I would, have, I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall or a guest at the Benson family table, especially after uh, the old poop Archbishop of Canterbury kicked the bucket. This is my favorite part of this tag, and this is the part that gets a little long. Five, the colorful leaves are piling up on the ground. Show us a pile of fall-colored spines. Oh, completely different from last year's. Here are my picks for 2018. How's that for fall-colored spines, eh? 
So let me tell you about them. I've only read two of these so far. Augustus by John Williams. John Williams' novel Stoner is, I think, the best novel ever written, certainly in the 20th century. And this is another novel by him that's very different from Stoner. I have not yet read this. Russell of Ink and Paper blog. Loved it. It's a historical novel set in ancient Rome. That doesn't attract me, but the fact that it's by John Williams definitely attracts me. So I will try it someday. This I picked up in Saskatoon in August. Transparent City by Anjaki. Anjaki is an Angolan novelist. And I think uh, uh, writing in Portuguese. So this was translated by Stephen Hennigan. And I love the page 112. It's uh, very experimental writing. I won't read from it, but uh, I'm intrigued uh, by it and uh, looking for a buddy reader. This is a 1925 novel from Canada, Wild Geese by Martha Ostenso. She was a Norwegian-Canadian novelist. Actually, she lived most of her adult life in the States. This one was set in Manitoba. I'm actually not sure if she was still living in Canada when she wrote it. Let's see. No, this was written when she after she had moved to uh, New York, but it's set in Manitoba. So we're going to claim it as a Canadian novel, and we can fight that out another day. But I studied it as an undergrad for a course in Western Canadian literature, and I remember that I really liked it, and I picked up a copy because I want to reread it. Oh, I'm dying to get to this one of these days. This is a set of short stories, I think very rare, uh, not, not widely available outside India. Panchlight and Other Stories by Paneshwar Nath Renu. I picked it up at a second-hand bookstore in Tokyo, published in India in 2010. I haven't done a lot of checking, but I bet you you'd be hard to find it outside India unless you stumble upon it in a used bookstore. Set in rural Bihar, which is the... Renu died in 1977, and one of Hindi's foremost writers. So this was translated from the Hindi by Rakshanda Jalio. I haven't even cracked it, but I want to... The Lady Who Liked Clean Restrooms by J.P. Donlevy. He was a Irish-American writer, right? This is a 1995 short little novel. I have to check. When I hauled this, I think I... Yeah, opposite of the, of the way most of these uh, writers' life paths go. He was born in America, in Brooklyn, in 1926, and died at... Well, that's obnoxious. And he died in... He died just last year, about a year ago, in County Westmeath, in Ireland. And this little novella is... Uh, I think I did a page 112 tag of it. It uh, sounds like a crazy story. And that's all I'll say for now. But it's a quick little read that I should just sit down and read. It's a, probably a one-sitting read. I talked about, just a few minutes ago, talked about Helen Humphrey's novel, The Lost Garden. This is another one of hers that I picked up. The Reinvention of Love. And I will be buddy reading this next year with Ange of Beyond the Pages because I recommended... The Lost Garden to her, and she loved it. This is a 2011 novel set in France during the reign of Napoleon III, and it's about a French journalist who has a love affair with Victor Hugo's wife. I don't often do very well with historical personages in my fiction, but I don't know anything about Victor Hugo's wife, so it should be okay. Couldn't resist adding this to the pile, Ali Smith's Autumn. I l absolutely loved it. It was the first Ali Smith I've read. I then went on to read How to Be Both, which the first half I loved, the second half I pretty much hated. So I'm a little bit shy of trying another one by her. I have Winter on my shelf, haven't got to it, but this was an absolute unparalleled delight. And lastly, this one, the spine particularly is a fall colors. Immigrant Montana, a novel by Amitabha Kumar. New release this year. I picked it up in Canada. And it's about an uh, Indian immigrating to post-Reagan America. I wonder if it will be any good. Sounds interesting. So that's my fall-colored spines. N number six. Fall is the perfect time for some storytelling by the fireside. Share a book wherein somebody is telling a story. 
For this one, I've chosen a book that was not a completely successful read for me, but one that I can't stop thinking about. So I may have to reread it one of these times. Summer Will Show by Sylvia Townsend Warner, a 1936 novel. I did this a few months ago as a buddy read with Eric Carl Anderson and Britta Bowler. It's about a aristocratic woman just before the revolution of 1848 and her hu husband has left her for another woman and he's gone to Paris and then her kids die of typhoid or something so she goes to track her husband down in Paris just before just like in the days leading up to the outbreak of the 1848 revolution because she wants him to fuck her basically so she can at least have another kid she and then she'll leave him alone and so she finds him and tracks him down at her, his mistress's house. And his mistress is Minna, a Jewish revolutionary woman. And so she goes to a house party in progress at Minna's house. And she sees her husband. I don't think her husband's seen her. And she kind of just walks into the house. And she's in an ante room, but she can see Minna in the other larger room. And the crowd are coaxing Minna to tell a story, so she's kind of known as a storyteller. Let me just read you the three paragraphs that then lead to the story that Minna tells. The fulsome voice was lost among other voices making the same request. That's Frederick, her mind cried out, and forgot him in the next instant, hearing in reply the voice whose ghost had spoken at her child's bedside, saying, Ma flu. No, not a fairy tale. I have told so many. This, this shall be a true story. See her she must, and in the jostle of rearrangement which had followed the requesting voices, Sophia shifted her place till she could see from the anteroom into the room beyond. When she could hear again, Minna was already speaking, leaning forward with her elbows on her knees, her face propped between her hands, the attitude of one crouched over a sleepy fire watching the embers waste and brighten and waste again. And that then goes on to chapter two, which is Minna's story, and it's the story of her birth and childhood, and it's a story of anti-Semitism and violence and all kinds of horrible stuff that she endured. And then it's broken in the middle, and if I remember, it's broken because the revolution <laughs> breaks out and interrupts the story and that rupture in the narrative it never really gets finished in the story and it was such an animating story in in the center of this confounding book that i've never uh, been able to forget it and feel like i need to reread the entire novel as frustrating of a read as it was in so many ways just to get more of a handle on the power of that story that minna tells so there you go that's my answer for that one Oof, I'm getting all worked up this morning. Prompt number seven. The nights are getting darker. Share a dark, creepy read. Well, I don't typically read dark, creepy, creepy reads. I talked about some last year that I was pretty unsatisfied with. However, I just heard recently about one that I want to try. I think I'm overcommitted, so I'm not going to be able to fit it in before Halloween, but I do want to try it just because it's outside my comfort zone. And I heard Katie of Books and Things uh, review it a, a few weeks ago, or actually, she, I think it was on a TBR. She hadn't read it, but the way she talked about it made me really curious. It's called Pseudo Tooth, and the author is Verity Holloway. So the title and the author is already kind of creeping me out. And I can't remember everything that Katie said. I'll put a link to that video if you want to check it out. But it was enough for me to check and scribbed had it. So I read the first couple pages and then I read page 112. The writing was really good. It's about a, a young woman who's having unexplained blackouts in the modern era. Pseudo seizures. The doctors and the, her family don't understand. She's sent to recuperate in the Suffolk countryside. And she takes solace in the writing of William Blake and fills her journals with visions she's having about a, an East Londoner haunted by his family history back in Russia. I think I have to try it. I don't do well with genre fiction, but this one had enough of literariness to the writing and it's just that description makes me kind of go, ooh, I have to try it. So I'll let you know how it is. Has anybody else read it? So that's my answer for that one.
Pseudo tooth. What a name. Eight, the days are getting colder. Name a short, heartwarming read that could warm up somebody's cold and rainy day. And for this, I've chosen Thomas Hardy's short novel, Under the Greenwood Tree. I just finished it the day before yesterday. I talked about it in my Friday read, so I'll just say that it is a really yeah, heartwarming, charming novel, quiet, about a group of uh, rural people living in a hamlet in his fictional county of Wessex. Uh, they're all members of the choir, and choir is spelled Q-U-I-R-E. How much more heartwarming do you need it to get than that? And one of the younger guys falls in love with the new school teacher, and to the degree that there's any story, it's the romance between them, which is a really sensuous tale, set on the backdrop of these really colorful, larger-than-life characters in the little hamlet. And apparently these characters are very minor characters in Hardy's later novels set in the same area, but in this story they are foregrounded and it just charmed the pants off. Published about 1871, I think. Number nine, Fall returns every year. Name an old favorite that you'd like to return to soon. And I hesitate to talk about it because I've been talking about it on almost every video I've made recently, book haul and this and that, but The Waves by Virginia Woolf. I'm going to reread it for the first time in about 30 years in December. And I, all I remember about my first read was that I absolutely loved it. And when I tried to have a conversation about it with my best friend, I got all choked up and couldn't speak. And that's all I remember. So I'm dying to reread it. And then I'm going to reread Lenny Zumas's Bone Clocks, which was kind of inspired and patterned on the waves. And I couldn't see that when I read, did I say Bone Clocks? That's David Mitchell. Lenny Zumas's Red Clocks because apparently it was inspired by and patterned on the waves. And when I read Red Clocks a few months back, I couldn't see it because I don't have any memory of this book. So I'm going to reread this and I can't wait. Number 10, fall is the perfect time for cozy reading nights. Share your favorite cozy reading accessories. Well, I've only got one. The last one. 11. Spread the autumn appreciation and tag some people. Okay, I didn't get that organized, so let me just go through some recent comments. Shani reads. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Tired Mama tries to read. Sorry I've been tagging you a lot, but deal with it, my dear. Zoe Beck. Ula Goodnison. A bookish. I don't remember if you do tags, but you might enjoy doing this. An enthusiastic reader and my reading days also open tag for anybody who wants to do it and I'm gonna specifically tag just one reader who generically tagged me so right back at you I want to see your 2018 version and those of you who did it last year do it again it's fun thanks for watching